You wouldn't know it if you just subscribed to this channel, but I listen a lot more than I talk. If I only talked like this, I wouldn't learn. Every day I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, reading and listening to other people. Because I follow topics I'm interested in, you know, all the different stuff that I talk about on this channel, and because I follow so many people, I get to hear diverse voices on each topic. Every time I go online, someone teaches me something new, or even better, why I was wrong about something. I owe those people with those voices most of my learning and unlearning from the past 15 years. Because even though I've done the reading and the checking and the weighing of arguments by myself, I never would have known thinking differently was possible if it hadn't been for people on the internet who knew more about something than I did. A whole world of wisdom is out there if you look for it. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Eighty years ago, if you wanted to know what was going on somewhere else, you listened to the radio. There wasn't a wide selection of stations. The radio told us what to think about everything. Even 25 years ago, the media meant a few government or corporate-owned news agencies. Nowadays, however, we don't have to rely on media that's concentrated in the hands of a few powerful people. Now, media content is created and uploaded every second on the internet. We should rethink how we get our news. Today, we are the media, not just the big corporations. This video is about why and how to take advantage of the new media. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to Triangular Space for sponsoring this video. Triangular Space, because sometimes you should just like and subscribe. I find solutions usually emerge from the logic of one's criticism. So let's start by talking about the old media, the dinosaurs that still exist as a kind of hangover from before the internet. First, they're owned by people with very different interests from yours. I mean, this graphic's a bit old, but you get, you get the point. Media ownership is highly concentrated in the hands of a few huge corporations. These are the people who are telling you about politics and the economy and how they work and how they're supposed to work. Politics is about power, all right? But the biggest media act as a shield to power. If the news doesn't provide the context of power to political news, it's not giving you much of the story. They tell you uh, what politicians or police are saying. Well, where are the voices disagreeing with them, challenging their exercise of power? But politicians and cops aren't even the really powerful people, because as everyone knows, but not everyone wants to admit, politicians are owned by rich people with lobbyists. So if we wanted to know the truth about politics, we would follow the money to know how these decisions were really being made and by whom. But news stories hardly ever track the money. If they did, they might end up having to investigate themselves. If all you know about politics is what you've learned from mass media, you don't understand politics. So the news presents itself as objective when it is, in fact, highly ideological, highly biased in favor of the existing power structure. Real questions would shake things up. We often cite numbers of factual errors in news reporting as criticism, but that's not the problem with the news. The problem is the very limited perspective it provides. Not enough context or connecting the story to broader themes. No talk about who benefits and carefully selected and edited dissenting voices. And why not? Expecting the news to question propaganda is like expecting a whole department to close down when the police investigate themselves. That's why I always think if you want to understand the news, you should understand the topic first because then 
you have some idea of what's being left out. Let's imagine a simple headline. Uh, U.S. criticizes China on human rights. Headlines like that come around a couple of times a year. Now, they're not really lying, but they're not putting it into perspective either. The U.S. government commits atrocities every day when it bombs people overseas. It has by far the largest prison population in the world. Its police regularly commit murder and walk free, minus, you know, obviously the occasional uh, sacrificial lamb, as we saw in this past week. Obviously, the U.S. government is in no position to lecture the world on human rights. But a regular helping of headlines like this instills in the average person the idea that the U.S. is a leader in human rights, and China is the bad guy. The whole reason, the idea that the, 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 the U.S. Uh, even talks about human rights is so its citizens ignore the facts and believe the words. Governments have to give their subjects an enemy, especially a foreign enemy, so that they think their rulers are their protectors and never realize who the real enemy is. The media tend to follow the government line, so instead of questioning power, they just kind of explain its decisions to us. And in doing so, they tell us who our enemies are. I don't know that if, if, if you don't know the history of U.S. foreign policy, or whatever the topic is, you might actually believe them. The other thing about the news is, it's a waste of time. Your average news program covers the bare minimum on a few news stories, which you could probably have learned in a minute by scanning headlines, spends a few minutes on the weather, which you have probably already Googled if you care about it, talks about sports and celebrity gossip as if it mattered as much as real news, and shows you long bouts of commercials. At least newspapers give a little more depth to a story, although I usually just read the headlines. But the TV news is just infotainment with a bunch of commercials. Is it as worth your time as, say, reading, educating people, organizing? If you're watching or reading the news in order to analyze it, then great. I've done that. But I can't stand watching the news anymore, <laughs> so I avoid it. If I want to know what's going on in my field, there are already other people talking about it on social media. Sometimes a series of tweets can provide more perspective on an issue than a series of newspapers, and they take way less time to read. Dissenting voices are rare on TV, and radical voices go unheard altogether. Fortunately, those voices exist on other platforms, and if you really want to learn, you can look for them. Only radical voices will provide the perspective you need to have a more complete understanding of an issue. By the way, when I say radical, please don't confuse it with reactionary. Reactionaries are the ones whose views are steeped in white supremacy and patriarchy. They'll believe anything, and they'll say anything to make you believe it too. There's a big difference between the people who claim to be being oppressed and the people who are actually oppressed. Radicals stand up for the oppressed. As such, they want to overturn the status quo. Reactionaries just reinforce existing systems of oppression. So to know radicals from reactionaries, it helps to know how oppression works. You'll want to know about intersectionality. I'll let you Google it if you don't know what that is, since Kimberlé Crenshaw can explain it a lot better than I can. When you get to know how uh, intersectionality works, you can tell who's oppressed and who is the oppressor. You need some understanding of class, so you'll want to understand capitalism and the state. You should understand racism, so you'll need to know something about imperialism and colonialism and how they made white supremacy the norm. You need to understand something about gender, how women and non-men have been treated historically, and why it still matters. 
But you only need a basic understanding of these things to recognize people who don't know what they're talking about. You can identify online reactionaries on your own, I'm sure. You know, like there's this guy. Or this asshole. This clown. And their grand wizard. You'll know them, because they'll be the ones shitting on oppressed people. In doing so, they ignore facts and make up their own, but they talk fast and confidently, and they know how to appeal to people's prejudices. If you don't know how to think differently, and you don't fact-check them, you might believe what they say. You can know a reactionary pretty fast if you want to test them. Bring up the latest police killing, and if they've already accepted and are glad to repeat all the excuses for it, they're reactionaries. So, of course, they aren't interested in looking for patterns or learning about causes of police killings. It's an example of how they ignore how systems work. For another example, take the causes of poverty. You can understand how poor people became poor by asking them. Usually you find out it's because something's been taken from them. They had a source of income, but lost it and couldn't find another. They had a home, but the landlord or the bank or the state took it away. You can factor in the likelihood of those things happening if you're white versus if you're black, native, Latino, and so on. The statistics exist, you could do that, but it doesn't take a lot of observation to realize white people have it better. And it doesn't take a long understanding of history to know why. The systems we live under make people poor by taking from them. Reactionaries will tell you things like, people are poor because they're lazy. And people who are black, native, Latino, and so on are extra lazy, and that's why they're extra poor. Don't look for causes. Trust what I tell you the causes are. Look at a couple of carefully selected statistics and believe what I say about them. Don't try to understand systems. Only individual behavior matters. Assume everything you were told in elementary school about living in a country where everyone gets freedom and justice was true. Most people do, even though they might not admit it. So they're susceptible to reactionary grifters. Then they'll tell the world that because they're criticized and called out for racism, their opponents just call everyone racist. People will cancel their media interviews and they'll say they're being censored. That way, they can flip the idea of oppression on its head. So they come across as oppressed while they rake in thousands of dollars a week in donations, merchandising, and ads, and give speeches to packed auditoriums. There's a reason why, until now at least, reactionaries have been more widely followed than radicals on social media. And it's because what they say resonates with the worldview of someone who has never questioned the propaganda, or only questions it from a liberal conservative framework. If I don't know any poor people, or any black people, or any trans people, or any poor black trans people, and I don't seek their points of view, what reactionaries say about them might sound true. I mean, they even have their token black people, you know, like this lady. And badge guy. And their token LGBTQ people. Like, trans woman at the wrong table? And fabulous fash? So that they can say, see, how could we be prejudiced? But they always take the side of the oppressor over the oppressed. Parading token minorities around, 
or for that matter, having a black wife, doesn't absolve you of racism or other reactionary tendencies. That's why I'm saying on social media, you should be following radicals, people who fight against the status quo, against racism and poverty and oppression. Radicals aren't always right, but at least they tend to read philosophy, listen to facts, and report from the ground. They're people not afraid to speak an unpopular truth. Not a lie. I don't follow people if I know they lie to me, or, or, or just if they're long on rhetoric and short on facts. But an unpopular truth that millions of people won't accept just because it challenges their beliefs. Radicals are people who will call you out for shitty behavior, like racism and sexism. You should want that. You might get uncomfortable because it feels like an insult, but that's the pain of realizing you have toxic beliefs left to unlearn. I would, wouldn't have realized how many such beliefs and attitudes I had if not for all the people who, who've taught me and challenged me. Radicals aren't likely to be especially polite or spare your feelings, but if you're really there to learn, that shouldn't matter to you. They're, they're talking about important issues, and it's okay to get angry about them. The main thing is to listen. You don't always have to comment your opinion. It's usually okay to ask questions, but be respectful of others' time. You might not even have to ask. You might just be able to Google it. So you're looking for new media to follow. If you're white, it's easy to just listen to other white people. I know. It takes a bit more effort to seek out lots of different people with different experiences from white people. And it's okay, by the way, uh, if they've taught you something when they ask for money, it's okay to oblige and kick a few bucks their way. If you're cis, it's easy to find other cis people giving their opinions on gender, and it shouldn't be, but there you have it. If you want to learn about gender from people who experience it differently, great, look for it. There are plenty of trans and non-binary people out there who have educated me for free just by making Twitter accounts. If you're learning about intersectionality, you might also want to listen to people with disabilities, people with mental illnesses, people with autism, people with addiction, and learn about how society fails them. If you want to learn how things are in other parts of the world, you could do a lot better than Press TV or Sputnik or Telesur. They'll give you a bit more perspective than Fox, but they have their biases too. And just like all major media platforms, they answer to the powerful. So there's no reason to believe they're significantly more trustworthy than the others. There are a lot of media out there that call themselves anti-imperialist, but they tend to take a very reductive understanding of things, like U.S. bad, Russia, China, Syria, good. The Gray Zone is a great example of that. These media discredit actual movements of oppressed people in those countries. So in claiming to defend the truth about foreign powers, they provide people like Putin and Bashar al-Assad with a bullhorn. You might want to Google criticism of specific media if you're going to treat them as authorities. Alternatively, you can ignore them. If you want to understand Syria, you don't do it by listening to the likes of Max Blumenthal. There are real Syrian people online now who've been talking about the conflict since its beginning. The good news is, if you have principles, you can oppose all oppressors not just American ones, and support the movements of oppressed people all over the world. I have thousands of people around the world I've never met to thank for telling me how things are where they live, countering all the other stories from other media. Thanks to them, I learn something new every time I go online, whether about something going on right now, or a different point of view on an issue I'm interested in, or about a book I should read, a video I should watch, a Twitter account I should follow. So how do you find people? Well, do they talk about stuff you're interested in? 
Do they challenge your thinking? And most importantly, are they right? Now, as we know, on the internet, you never know who's behind these accounts or what their intentions are, so that's another thing to, to bear in mind and think critically about. I'm sure you can think of ways to question those things. If someone has a consistent message over time, I tend to think I can trust them. But it's okay not to be sure of anything you hear. There's a lot of bullshit out there. Why even commit to a belief if you haven't researched it thoroughly? The point is to listen to people. The more people I listen to, the more certain stories come together. The news tells us the police's side of things and maybe one of the eyewitnesses they interviewed. When I go on Twitter or wherever and look for people who were there, they tell a different story. When other people's accounts always clash with the official line, you can't help but notice a pattern. In fact, Everything I've ever studied in any depth clashes with the official line. I can usually question a headline or news story pretty quickly if it's about something I know. And people who know other stuff can do the same when it's about their fields. Everybody I meet who knows a lot about something tells me things are not what they seem. Every business, every industry, every field has a dark side most people don't know about. Media should expose that dark side. Otherwise, it's just PR. What, what are they choosing to leave out? Is it essential facts of history? How do the people at the top of whatever institutions are involved benefit from this issue? Who loses from it? And what do they lose? Nowadays, we are the media. We can expose the dark side of things. We can educate each other. I think doing so is an essential part of our liberation. I think we should treat social media like information networks. I'm here to provide facts and different ways of thinking. I can correct you on some things. You can do the same to me. We can help each other become wiser. And in fact, You've already taught me more than I can ever thank you for.